my name is Pete Kingston. I'm um, a master's student at Plymouth College of Art. Um, I, this is probably about the third of the um, events that I've been along to, um, and they've all been really useful as someone who is trying to establish myself as an artist or someone who's part of the greater artistic world in Exeter. Um, it just seems a really valuable uh, occasion to be part of. The journey down today kind of is typical of kind of my start to the working week, kind of being stuck at Bristol Temple Meads for a ridiculous amount of time and trying to get to places and delays. And it kind of shows on a daily basis just kind of the difficulties of getting around the Southwest. When it was turned into Visual Arts Southwest, it was kind of deemed to, instead of talking about that as a, a negative thing, that we should celebrate what the region is, uh, the places and the artists here, and trying to promote a strong visual arts sector that would encourage not only people to stay in the region, um, not by strong arming them or anything like that, but kind of that each part of the region can provide either a long-term or a short-term basis for locating your practice as an artist uh, and also supporting the myriad of different scales of organizations that we have. Uh, if we're going to do stats and we can do stats that we have the largest amount of artists of any other region. We're also the, the least funded region despite being um, the largest. We're generally asked forward facing and kind of like, what do you want to see? or what, what's important to you. And then we build program strands around that. The longest running is the go and see strand, which we give um, small amounts of money out to artists and organizations to be able to get around the region. We're gonna do a survey across the Southwest of groups that are working with young people. Uh, and then out of that group, we'll select a certain a small group of young people who will then start programming and we'll be able to hear those voices coming through. More kind of aligned to artist practice is um, we're going to be doing a series of temperature tests in terms of the main one we'll be looking at studio provision and map what that is across the region so we can use that information to as evidence that we can then take to local authority to prove the worth of creative workspaces in different cities and rural areas. The average income for an artist in England is £6,000. And if you take into the national average in the UK is around £27,000. That's artists earning well below the poverty line, yet we, are, we work in a sector that is a predominantly middle class pursuit. Um, and it means that artists are not being recognised for their worth by the very people that rely on artists. So we're involved with the Paying Artist campaign. They've been working tirelessly to change that perception of artists being paid properly. There's an on-the-ground misunderstanding by artists that what you have is a career um, and that your financial worth needs to be written into your absolute day-to-day -day practice. Money shouldn't be a dirty word for artists and career and long-termism and strategy and making sure opportunities that you're plugged into that, which is obviously a whole host of what Visual Arts Southwest tried to do. When this livelihood event, uh, research finally gets published by the Arts Council, this is like probably the one chance to try and change that uh, the existing status quo because those figures have been set in place for a long time and we're being judged on historical levels of pay and historical levels of local authority engagement and it, it's, the situation has changed and it's completely fluid as well it'll change again in five years. I feel very strongly that we can be openly critical of uh, policies because artists can if we empower artists at every level then we can affect policy change and it's just by making sure that artists are being listened to 
and that artists understand some of these day-to-day -day things about financial worth. These, this is the time where we can change policy that might sit in place for the next 10 years. Um, I don't know if anyone's visited the exhibition Weaver People, our other work. Yep. So that came about as um, part of Plymouth's organisation's programming group, PVAC, as it is known. Um, there's also a cultural arts policy in the city, Plymouth Platforms, that came about last year. Um, so yeah, so cultural organisations are pretty good now at working together. In 2014, some of those organisations came together with independent artists, curators and producers to form Visual Arts Plymouth with the support of Visual Arts Southwest. And it came about because there was a need to bridge the gap between independent artists and cultural organisations and also to promote and develop visual arts in the city. We are a group of 14 volunteers uh, we sign up for a year and most of us actually do longer than that year. It, it kind of works better. <laughs> Currently delivering um, a mentorship programme and that is three artists at the start of their careers being mentored by three more established artists. The other strand of talent development is we run a series of workshops for artists and creatives. Like we, we plan in advance, but we try and be flexible to what, um, what people need at the time. Uh, we just ran quite a good artist writers workshop and from that an artist writers group has come about. There's been a lot more uptake this year. We noticed with the Plymouth Art Weekend of people were writing about it. Um, we, and we can see that that's, like, that's something that needs to be strengthened in the city. Um, and we also run open forums, which are just a way of getting feedback. We are not an organisation that needs funding year in, year out to run. VAP's model is that we're flexible and we react to what the city needs. We very much see ourselves as like uh, as an incubator. We've got the we've got the time um, to to test stuff out and see what works and also what doesn't. We've we've had some learning curves, and then we pass it on, and other organisations or groups can deliver it. I was trying to work out the best way of talking about these kind of numerous things. <laughs> what might be interesting is to talk about the last 10 years in Exeter. Uh, so around that time, 2008, 2009, I was going to art previews at the Phoenix and at the Gloss and uh, went to a few of the Exeter Open Studios events and things like that. And what I found was that it was quite a difficult community to get into, that um, I was talking, you know, I was finding a lot of people's backs and uh, people kind of huddled around having their own conversations. Uh, I was also going to the brew house in Taunton regularly because they ran an artist critical group. And I thought it was hilarious the fact that I was having to go into Somerset to meet up with a group of artists to talk about our work when I knew that there was a big community in Exeter. 2011, the Occupy movement happened, and uh, from that, it also made me question what the Open Studios model was in Exeter. What is Open Studios about? What is this kind of middle-class agenda that, that kind of runs through the arts? And that's what seemed to be left. The radical stuff seemed to be gone in Exeter. We had this kind of big middle-class bit of people spending 80 to 100 pounds, 100 and something pounds to, to show their work. I hated it, so I set a thing up called Nose, which was not Open Studios Exeter. And then the cultural partnership kind of lifted its head above the parapet. And apparently, within Exeter, we'd had this thing called the cultural partnership. Now, not many people that I knew knew anything about this thing. So this cultural partnership run, ran a consultation for a cultural strategy in the city. So what they then did is commission some consultants to come in and to talk to all of the people who were cultural stakeholders to form this cultural strategy. So through one of these consultations, I met some other artists, and one of them, I said, oh, I've been living in the city for five years now, where do artists go to talk to each other? And she said, what do you mean? <laughs> the outcome of the consultation was that the city isn't ready to have a cultural strategy. <laughs> now, we still, we just still don't have a proper cultural strategy for the city. This is now five years later. And then at that point, I, I thought that I'd kind of had enough of just kind of sitting by the sidelines. So I contacted Dom Jinks, who was the, the chair of the cultural partnership at the time. And I asked what representation there was for individual practitioners on that cultural partnership. Of course, there wasn't any. Um, so they said, well, why don't you come along and join us? So I did. 2014, in November, I called for there to be a visual art forum in Exeter. Um, loads of people turned up. 
it was a, a great space um, in that loads of organisations sent people to come along as well as artists and practitioners. I mean, in summary, that's kind of what I see the role of the, of the Visual Arts Forum and the cultural partnership being, is, is us kind of looking at the, the amazing stuff that we've got around us and actually celebrating it, but also being able to come together around it as well. Mm -hmm.